Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. We talk about Blu-rays here. My name's Brian, and uh, for this episode, we are talking about one of my favorite labels in general, certainly one of my favorite Vinegar Syndrome partner labels, and that is Fun City Editions. They are coming off of a wonderful and outstanding release of the film Born to Win with George Siegel, a great um, movie about an addict. Uh, and so I was very curious what would be next after that. And after that, we have gotten Dushan Makayev's The, Co- the Coca-Cola Kid from 1985, I believe. This is the lovely slip cover. Beautiful artwork. And this is the alternate artwork on the inside. Uh, yeah, 85. So this film, as you can see, stars Eric Roberts and an actor named Greta Skaki, I think. That's how you pronounce it. I thought it was Skachi, but uh, Skaki, I think. Um, and it is a really interesting, quirky comedy. Uh, it opens with this really almost ludicrous disclaimer. Uh, I'll read some of it because I think it's funny. Uh, it says, This film is a work of fiction. Neither the film nor its makers have any connection with Coca- the Coca-Cola Company or any of its affiliates. The Coca-Cola Company has not licensed, sponsored, or approved this film in any way. And it goes on to add, All persons, events, and characters in this film are entirely fictional. The film in no way purports to present an accurate account of the activities of the Coca-Cola Company, its subsidiaries or affiliates in Australia, past, present, or future. And there's actually like even two more lines of disclaimer. Um, So it's noted in the commentary that most films have a a disclaimer of this type at the end. You know, characters are fictional, et cetera, et cetera. And this film does not have that instead they put it in the front but it's clear that the coca-cola company did not want anyone to associate them with this movie that definitely piques your interest right i mean why does coca-cola not want anything to do with this film i think right out of the gate i'm like oh really okay well let's see what the deal is and um it's a very quirky movie You know, um, I must admit that I have confused this film for many years with the Flamingo Kid, uh, another 80s movie, uh, in this case starring Matt Dillon and directed by Gary Marshall. But it couldn't be more different than that. And Gary Marshall and Dushan Makayev, light years apart (laughs) as filmmakers, Um, Dushan Makayev would do uh, WR, The Mysteries of the Organism, Sweet movie, Montenegro, very cult, um, anarchic films, and he was a very anarchic guy from all accounts. Um, just very free spirited in his working, uh, his mentality and his working relationship and um, w- relationships with folks on the set. Anyway, uh, so Coca Cola Kid, Flamingo Kid, uh, obviously the 80s was obsessed with kid movies, the late 70s as well. You had The Karate Kid being probably the biggest most successful kid movie there was you had the heavenly kid the dirt bite kid with peter billingsley from christmas story you had uh a series of gary coleman vehicles uh the kid with the broken halo the kid from left field uh which i guess is a not a remake but there's a 1953 film of that same name that i didn't know uh and my personal favorite uh the kid with the 200 iq so there were tons of kid movies back then, and I, I think this one gets a little lost because of that trend, maybe. Um, but yeah, so it's made by uh, Yugoslavian born, uh, filmmaker Dusan Makayev, and um, yeah, he's just a really interesting voice, and you can get a sense of that from this movie because the plot is sort of a simple, straightforward thing. The idea is basically you have an ex-Marine played by called Becker, played by Eric Roberts, who's become this guru at Coca-Cola, this marketing genius. And they send him to Australia, to Sydney, I guess, um, the Sydney office, to try to figure out 
what he can do there to increase Coca-Cola sales. And the movie opens with this really interesting, again, quirky scene where he's on the plane about to get off and it's a commercial airline and it's just landed. And he immediately, we see these quarantine officers that are roaming the cabin of the plane uh, with these big aerosol spray cans. And there's an announcement uh, on the PA that says that this is an essential precaution against insects, which might otherwise introduce human or agricultural diseases in Australia. Whether or not that's an actual practice back then or not wouldn't surprise me too much, uh, but it's a fun and interesting way to just see this guy, this very well coiffed guy getting sprayed and sneezing and all this stuff. Um, so it sort of sets the stage uh, for this character and and you immediately get a sense that he's like one of those driven guys that's just sort of quirky and he immediately sort of clashes with the laid back work ethic and lifestyle that seems to be uh, happening at the Coca-Cola branch in in uh, Sydney, in Australia. And that starts with, you know, the guy that he meets with and then Greta Skaki uh, is like his secretary and she's very sort of unorthodox and in his mind unprofessional sort of clash a little bit which I can talk about later when I get to the Greta interview that's not a fake thing um she didn't particularly like the experience of she was excited to work with him but ultimately the experience was not what she wanted uh I think so anyway we'll get into that in a minute but um there's a great scene with this 3d sales map that's reminiscent of like war games or something where they're looking at all the coca-cola sales in australia and they find this one spot and it's like what's going on here there's no sales at all and it's in this like remote area this little valley and you come to find out that there is a guy there they, they, they used to have a rep there but something i don't know what happened to the guy but there's a guy there that is sort of his own guru and set up his own his mcdowell is his name and he set up his own soda factory like he makes his own soda and he he kind of owns the valley like you know he employs people there in his factory and he has like this police officer that strong arms anybody from coke that comes in and um it's almost like there's a little bit of colonel kurtz in there or something i can't quite put my finger on it it's more comedic than that but um i was thinking about that a little bit um but um yeah so so it's an interesting thing where he finds himself drawn to this guru guy and wanting to convert him and wanting to get him to sell coke and you know win him sort of win him over but also kind of like i'm the boss too it's it's a really interesting dynamic um but he's a very quirky guy and just has like sort of an odd manner about him you know he takes himself very seriously uh and there's just some situations that he's thrust into um one with uh, the Greta character's ex-husband, like an altercation in the office. He doesn't really know how to handle that. He doesn't really know how to handle his feelings about her um, and her daughter. And there's a really great relationship between her and her daughter. And there's even, we can talk about the nudity. There's a decent amount of nudity from the Greta character in the movie. And she talks about that also in an interview. There's some spontaneous things that would happen in, in the filming. And I think those scenes stand out. There's one of the mother and daughter showering together. That seems a little creepy when you say it, but it's just, a, it feels like it's certain kind of relationship that this mother and daughter have. And it just makes them, I don't know, that much more specific for some reason. And apparently it was something that was come up with on, not on the spot, but it was, you know, not in the script. Um, but there are a couple scenes like that that involve nudity and which Greta was very free about. And they seem to sort of make the movie feel more interesting, not because of the nudity, but because of the, the you can feel a certain spontaneity to them. And I think that's part of the charm of Makayev as a filmmaker is that it's, there's things that are, he's allowing for things like that to enter the film, to not only be present in uh, a scene, but that that they're you know it is in a script, but also things that are not in the script finding their way in, and so I think it's a really interesting movie, an underseen, underrated, certainly by me, because um, I think I had seen it, but I did not remember it. So it was great to sort of revisit it in this way, with a new 2K restoration from its 35 millimeter interpositive, 
as uh, is, you know, the tradition from Fun City. They do a great job with that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's really an interesting film. I would say it is something that could go with a film like Local Hero. Uh, Bill Forsyth's film Local Hero, another quirky and interesting filmmaker, another film about sort of big business invades a quirky small community kind of thing. Um, and I think there's also a, a musical element that I hadn't thought about that kind of connects and Mark Knopfler to the score to this film. Uh, and Tim Finn does a really fantastic Coca-Cola jingle. Uh, it's like, don't want to go where there's no Coca-Cola. It's a incredibly catchy song that they actually sort of compose in the film as sort of one of the things that Eric Roberts's character is going for. Tim Finn is coming out of the band Split Ends before Crowded House, which is sort of his next thing, and worked on some of the music in the film. And I'll be darned if you don't finish the movie and have that song stuck in your head. So anyway, there's a musical connection between the two. I really think the more I think about it, Local Hero and Coca-Cola Hit Kid is an incredible double. Um, so there's that movie... Um, and then, uh, you know, I guess another cola movie that's, that's quirky and interesting is Billy Wilder's one, two, three, which is a kind of a goofy comedy that he did with James Cagney. Um, you know, sort of an American in, uh, you know, sort of a cold war situation. Um, so I think either, either of these could, this could also go with this movie. I think it'd be fun. If you haven't seen one, two, three, it's, it's enjoyable. It's it's like lighter than some of Billy Wilder's comedies, but it's a really great performance from James Cagney. Um, anyway, I was just thinking Local Hero, one, two, three, some stuff to go with these. Um, and um, it's got some nice features on it. It has uh, a commentary from Fun City's own uh, Jonathan Hertzberg, and uh, a um, he's joined by film programmer Lars Nilsson, and it's a great sort of conversational commentary. They've obviously done research. They obviously have things to bring to bear on the conversation, but they're also pointing things out as you, they go. And uh, it's enjoyable stuff. You know, I like both gentlemen, and I enjoyed hearing them talk about this film. I like. I would hang out with both and 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 watch the movie with them. And so it was. It was a nice, um, you know, low key commentary in some respects. But I totally dug it. Um, it also has. A new interview, Dark and Bubbly, which is a video interview with Eric Roberts that's about 11 minutes long. Um, I, I don't know that he has a ton of recollection of this film in particular. I mean, it is a long time ago, uh, so you never can tell. And he's done a lot of movies in the interim. I mean, this is a guy who works quite regularly. Um, he even mentioned something about his wife keeping him on task in the way that I guess Dushan Makayev's wife did maybe during the production, something like that. Um, so anyway, he doesn't seem to have a ton of specific memories. Uh, so he does do the sort of, you know, talking about his early work, talking about Star 80 and how that sort of playing that evil dark character sort of loomed over him for a long time because um, it was a Fosse film and people took it very seriously. Uh, and he talks about coming off of Pope of Greenwich, Greenwich Village. So he did Star Eddie, Pope of Greenwich Village, and this in relatively quick succession. And he wanted it to be an example of how he had a certain range. And you can definitely see that if you watch all three of those movies. There's a great deal of range there. He's a great actor. There's no question. Um, but he also said that, you know, uh, this movie was kind of like a paid vacation for him. It was He saw it as a light, uh, you know, process ultimately um i think he liked makayev he liked australia um he said most of the character st stuff was on the page or the little quirky things that were added were straight from dusha makayev so like there's not a lot of improvisation maybe he didn't invest it's hard to say maybe he didn't invest himself as much in developing the character and allowed himself to just be sort of open to suggestion from Makayev, whatever whatever the process was, I think it's an interesting character and one of the more interesting and slightly obtuse uh, but intriguing characters that Eric Roberts has ever played. Um, yeah, he talks about working with Greta Skaki and how he got along with her or, or he liked her. He just kept talking about how beautiful she was or something. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um 
because the other thing that's on here, well, there's a few more things, but the I love the title of the interview is The Real Thing, and it's about 32 minutes, and it is Greta and producer David Rowe. Um, not quite half and half. I would say it's a little more Greta than Rowe, uh, but David Rowe has he sort of opens the interview, and he talks about getting the project off the ground, talks about liking uh, Frank Morehouse's writing. Frank Morehouse is the screenwriter and his, I think a couple of his stories from a couple different books were adapted by him into this script to make this one movie. Um, definitely seems like a unique voice as a writer and somebody that I'm curious about now having seen the film again or not. I don't know, uh, if I've seen it before regardless, but it's, it's a quirky feeling in terms of the writing. And I, I dug that about it. Um, and he talked about he liked Makayev and he liked this writer. He thought they would go well together. And he talks about Eric Roberts being a little, taking himself a little seriously as an actor, maybe, in contrast to Greta, who was much more free and sort of open. And Greta definitely has some things to say about Eric Roberts. And she's not unkind, but she's definitely honest about it. Um, she also talks about meeting, I'll get to the Eric Roberts. She talks about meeting Makayev and I think during um, a period where she had just made a Heat and Dust, which is a Merchant Ivory movie. And she had some heat herself in terms of this was a, her big break. And I think she met him at a festival maybe. And she was a fan of like Fellini and Vim Vendors and uh, Herzog. And she saw him as of a piece with them and this sort of authorship that's there and wanted to work with him and was excited by it, even though he was, she does mention he has a certain anarchic spirit that you can see. If you watch even clips from WR Mysteries of an Organism, you can see how anarchic and wild that movie is. And, you know, that would seem to reflect some of his personality and how she was drawn to that, but it also ended up proving to be a difficult thing on the set uh, as he got into conflict with folks on the set and ultimately, you do hear a little bit of this from the producer and from Eric Roberts that there were some difficulties on the set. Mostly people are nice about what they have to say about it, but it's clear that his process maybe isn't always that conducive to keeping things moving forward. I don't know. Um, anyway, so then she goes into a little more detail about the Eric Roberts thing and that he was a little difficult in that she said they had no relationship off camera at all. And on camera, he wouldn't even look her in the eye when he did his lines with her. And then when he had his half of a scene, mostly actors would like to have the other actor there to give them something to engage with. He preferred not to have her there. So there's, I don't know if it was, you know, ego or whatever, but she said that basically he had to somehow decided that he was not willing to improvise with this group. In my head, I can only picture an actor who feels above the group that he's been put in with. Uh, that's just my read. I don't know that that's what happened, but she said he wouldn't improvise not only on camera, but he, but off camera, he was just very not interested in that. And, um, she says that, uh, there was a thing where basically there's a love scene <clears throat> where she has to, again, it was come up, it was came up with on the spot by Makayev, not on the spot, but not in the script where she's supposed to kiss Eric Roberts, his feet on up his body to his lips. And she was willing to do it. She's also very open about nudity and how, you know, it's as an actor, you reveal so much about yourself, uh, so many parts and things of yourself that the nudity, your body is the least you can do. That's her mindset. So she's very free with her body in the film. And I think in general about nudity which, you know, does give the film a certain interesting feeling. And I, I enjoyed the fact that she was so open about it, you know. Um, but anyway, so she there's this scene she has to do with Eric Roberts, and apparently she wanted to do it in one take because she didn't particularly like doing it. And so, you know, she's been told it looks like she's enjoying it, but she said that was about her determination to not have to do the scene again. So it's unfortunate when you hear something like that after you watch the movie. You will watch the movie and realize, I don't know if I'm vibing that there's some chemistry here. Uh, it probably mostly is coming from her. 
because yeah, Eric Roberts's character is very again obtuse in a lot of ways, and and it, he makes it work somehow. He makes the guy almost confused in some sense. But regardless, um, always interesting to hear when something was not a positive experience. Uh, and yet in the movie, I didn't fully get that. So she did a wonderful job of acting like she was interested in him. So anyway, um, it's, it's a really solid movie and I enjoyed it. Uh, there is also a booklet essay here and here's the disc. The booklet essay is by Spike Carter. And I'll read the opening paragraph here. Uh, in 1985, after a decade of in prep and two years in production, Yugoslavian art house filmmaker Dushan Makayev released the Coca-Cola Kid to a decidedly mixed reception. The challenging provocateurs most mainstream offering to date following W.R. Mysteries of the Organism, 1971, and Sweet Movie, 1974. It was scripted by Australian novelist Frank Morehouse, loosely adapted in over 10 drafts. Wow. Uh, f- from uh, several short stories he'd published in the 70s. The film's U.S. marketing tagline pitched itself as a new formula for comedy, ostensibly romantic come corporate satire. The novel, uh, the novel recipe, though, uh, think of a more off kilter local hero 1983 went down a little uh better than from infamously dead on arrival new coke anyway i won't go too far into that it's funny i didn't i didn't get a chance to read this yet so i hadn't made that read that comparison to local hero but i'm glad that i was on the right track as this gentleman um so anyway always nice to have a bonus essay and a great package from fun city so Definitely another very interesting movie to add to the Fun City collection. I think well worth your time, well worth checking out, and uh, definitely keep an eye on Fun City. Some future releases coming this year, I'm sure, are going to be fantastic as they have been since the very beginning. Uh, So I continue to love what Fun City does, and I will continue to champion them uh, moving forward. So anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.